Hey, good morning. How are you? Everybody doing well? Those of you online, welcome. We're glad you're here. We're glad to see you. You can't see us, but we're glad to be with you in your room or home or wherever you are. It is such, such an honor. I want to just make a quick plug for next Sunday morning. Next Sunday, we're going to do something completely different. So the preaching and the worship all goes together. So we're going to take all eight songs of the songs of the secret place, and we're going to kind of interconnect and weave through this. So don't be late. Don't tune in at 1020. Get on at 10 o'clock because it's all woven together. And we're going to try something we've never done before, which is very characteristic of Harborside. And it's going to work and it's going to be a great success, right? Amen. Amen. It is. I know it is. We're going to have fun with it. Uh, I'm really excited about today's song. Today's song is called You, and we just sang it, and we'll sing it again at the end. But I love the lyrics. I love what it talks about how, God, you're the one my heart longs for. And I think that's true with you. I think that's true with most of you that have just tuned in. I don't think you would be here. I don't think you would tune in if Jesus was not the one that your heart longed for. I I'm going to assume that all of you online and all of you in the room, I'm going to assume that by now you have figured out what your heart longs for. I'm going to make that assumption. You're old enough. You're mature enough. There might be a few of you going, I'm not sure what major in college. I'm not sure military. Co I, there may be a few of you that haven't figured that out. But I want to assume that most of you by now, you know what motivates you. You know what gets you up in the morning. You know what causes your heart to beat a little faster. I want to assume by now you're big boys and big girls and you kind of know what's going on in here. Is that fair? Seven of you know what's going on in here. Is that good? All right, all 17 of you by now. But I'm not going to assume that you know what God's heart longs for. I'm not going to assume that. Because when I look at what God's heart longs for, it took me a long time to really understand that what he longs for is you. And I didn't realize this even reading through the creation story. God's heart does not long for the sun, the stars, the moon, the grass, the trees, the bushes, the flowers, the beetles. God's heart does not long for all those things. God says those things were good. God's heart doesn't even long for the angels. The angels of God were not created for his heart. The angels of God were created as ministering spirits to come alongside and help him do his bidding. What God's heart longs for is you. Amen. You are the object of his affection. I think by now you figured out why you get up in the morning. Maybe it's Jesus. Maybe it's money. You figured that out. But I'm not sure that you figured out the heart of your heavenly father. And so the lyrics to this song are, Jesus, you're the one that my heart uh, longs for. Ethan, you were on the songwriting team that helped write this, you and Lisette probably and Hans. I'm not sure, were you on that as well? You weren't on that? That's why it's such a good song. <laughs> uh, kidding, bro, just kidding. Um, Tell us, tell us the backstory. Give us some facts about this song. Where were you? When was this written? Tell us a little bit about the song. Yeah, so about once a year, we try to get away to get refilled, and we got to go to a conference, a worship conference. We were in Miami, and uh, we were just kind of hanging out after I had my guitar, and Lisette said, you know, we should write a song about just about Jesus. And I said sarcastically, I'm like, yeah, like that's never been done before. <laughs> I'm like, every worship song we write's about Jesus. Can you get a little more specific? Um, <clears throat> but no, it, it was really, we, we joke about that to, the, to this day about this song. And it really was, yeah, that let's just write something pure and simple that God, you're the one we long for. It was a really amazing process, um, as is every song that comes from the Lord. And we just experience him, begin to birth something. And our entire team uh, got to write one line of the bridge, the lower, lower yielded to you, Holy Spirit. I'm totally dependent on you. Uh, that came from Joy, Lisette, John Mark and I, we all got to write one sentence to it. And so it was just like, it just, it was like God had 
something inside of each of us that when we all kind of poured out to the Lord that it, it came together. So it's a great, great song. And Amos, they didn't ask me to write any of that song either, so don't, don't feel bad. So, so this is a song about what you treasure. It's really about your heart's affection. What do you long for? And of course, Jesus says where your treasure is, remember this verse? There will your what? There will your heart be also. And so what Jesus is saying is where your treasure is, your treasure is what you love. Your treasure is what you think about. The treasure is what you dream about. The treasure is what you, you do to get up in the morning. So where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. It's really why the smartest man in all the world, King Solomon, said this, above all else, guard your heart. Your heart. For every issue of life flows, flows outside of your heart. And so we're, we're going to look at a couple people today, and we're going to see that they're from different walks of life, but they were passionate about Jesus. And I think that's most of you. And I know it's God's heart that you love him as much as he loves you. That's the heart affection of our heavenly father. So pause, let's start with um, the first story. This is Simon called Simon the Pharisee. In just a minute, we're gonna look at another Simon called Simon the leper. But this is Simon the Pharisee. And this guy is arrogant. This guy is cocky. He is a terrible host. You ever go to somebody's house and you're not really sure why you're there? I mean, they're not really very nice to you. Has that ever happened to anybody but me? You know, as a preacher, they, you know, you come in, they, some people go like this to you, right? But you're, you're in somebody's house and they, they don't offer you something to drink. And you're not really sure if you're supposed to sit down at the table. I mean, it's just like this guy was not nice to Jesus. And a lady bursts in. She just like busts through the doors and she has to see Jesus, which means she's already heard or experienced Jesus somewhere. So um, Mrs. Parker, would you, um, would you read for us uh, about three verses out of Luke chapter seven? <laughs> Sure. <laughs> um, <laughs> Sorry, I messed you up on that. You're a good father-in-law. All right, good, good. Um, so it says, when one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him, he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. A woman in that town who lived a sinful life learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house. So she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume. As she stood behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. Okay, did you get the picture? It's a big dinner. It's a nice banquet. Simon the Pharisee invites Jesus and all the boys over for dinner, and it's really not going that well because Simon the Pharisee is pretty arrogant. He's pretty cocky. And he's like, you know what? You're, you're blessed to be here, Jesus. He has no idea who Jesus is. And here's the son of man with the Pharisee. And Amos, finish the story for us. Verse 39, when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she is a sinner. Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher, he said. Two people owed money to a certain moneylender. One owed him 500 denarii and the other 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back, so he forgave the debts of both. Now, which of them will love him more? Simon replied, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt forgiven. You have judged correctly, Jesus said. Then he turned toward the woman and said to Simon, do you see this woman? I came into your house. You did not give me any water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. So about 20 years ago, I hear this story. Now look at the last verse. Look at verse 47. I hear this when I'm 20 years old and, and verse... Um, uh, 47. The, the point about that is he says, he who's been forgiven little loves little, and he who's been forgiven much loves much. And I heard this sermon, I thought, what does that mean? I don't really understand that. He who has been forgiven little loves little, 
but he who's been forgiven much loves much. And it was like an old timer guy, and some of you know Charles Swindoll, but Charles Swindoll did this, or how many of you know Charles Swindoll? Okay, yeah, you're old like me, okay? And he did this sermon, and it was like, if you're not really grateful for what Jesus has done, you're not gonna love people very well. You're not gonna love God very much. If you don't really realize what you've been forgiven from, you're kind of going to go through life going, you know what, life's good. I checked my church box and I checked my, you know, religious box. And I thought, man, that's so good. Here's a woman who understood she'd been forgiven of much. And she was so desperate for his presence. And that's one of the lines in this song. It's one of the lyrics that you guys wrote. She's so desperate for the presence of God that she will do something that's culturally just backwards. I mean, can you imagine rushing into somebody's home, busting through the front door, and all of a sudden start just hugging and kissing and loving on one of the guests, and you're not even invited to be there? I mean, I don't think any of you are crazy, that crazy to do that in our culture, are you? Some of you might be, I don't know. There's a little moment of hesitation there. That didn't go the way I thought it should. We got a crazy church. In this culture, I mean, she could have been speared or stabbed or shot. It's just incredible. And so here she is. She's so desperate. Here's a question. How desperate are you to meet with Jesus tomorrow morning? How desperate? How desperate are you? What's the longing of your heart? What's your heart affection? Well, we've got another story. This is Simon the leper. And this guy had to have been cleansed. We don't know if Jesus healed him, but he had to have been healed because he couldn't have all these people over to his house. So Simon the leper now has Mary and Martha. This is the Mary and Martha. And this this Mary is the one that comes in and she now breaks open this alabaster jar. So this is the woman who's watched Jesus heal her brother. She's watched Jesus raise Lazarus from the dead. And so it's an incredible story. So we had Simon the Pharisee who didn't do very well. Now we have Simon the leper who's like welcoming Jesus. And there's another woman, this time not a down and out woman, this time a very, very wealthy woman. Do I need to read this story for us? While he was in Bethany reclining at the table in the home of Simon the leper, a woman came with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume made of pure nard. She broke the jar and poured the perfume on his head. Some of those present were saying indignantly to one another, why this waste of perfume? It could have been sold for more than a year's wages and the money given to the poor. And they rebuked her harshly. Leave her alone, Jesus said. Why are you bothering her? She has done a beautiful thing to me. The poor you will always have with you. And you can help them anytime you want, but you will not always have me. She did what she could. She poured perfume on on my body beforehand to prepare for my burial. Truly, I say to you, wherever the gospel is preached throughout the whole world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. What a great story. You fit in this sermon this morning. You're so far one of these four people probably, okay? You might be Simon the Pharisee. Jesus, you're lucky to have me on your team, okay? Jesus, you're lucky I invited you to my house today. Jesus, you're you're just blessed because I came to church this morning. Jesus, you're blessed because I I tuned in online today. You you might be the woman that's very sinful, which is probably most of us. And most of us just have a boatload of sins. And if we really understand this, we have been forgiven much. And she loved much. And she, she was so desperate, so desperate to be in his presence. We might be like Simon the leper that there's been a miracle that's been performed in our lives. We know very specifically of something very miraculous that he's done, and we are so grateful. Jesus, you're the one my heart longs for. And so you're, you're doing everything you can. He's inviting Jesus and everybody to his house for dinner. You might be like the wealthy woman. And the wealthy woman took an alabaster jar, which was a year's wages. I don't know exactly what a year's wages are. Is it $30,000 a year? Is it $35,000 a year? Don't Google it right now. Pay attention, okay? But let's say it's 30 grand a year. She takes something that's worth $30,000 of perfume and she breaks it open and she begins to anoint Jesus' body. And it's really the line in the song that goes like, lower, lower yielded. Here's a very wealthy woman who is yielded. 
And you fit somewhere in this story. And all of us need to recognize where are we in a sermon kind of like this. So I want to make a statement. I want you to pay really close attention. And if you're folding the laundry, I want you to put the laundry down. And I want you to pay attention for just a minute. Okay? If Jesus is not the greatest longing of your life, you will be looking a lifetime for a replacement. If he is not the greatest longing of your heart, you will always be looking for something to fill it. And you'll try and you'll make more money and you'll build another business and you'll get another degree and you'll have another adventure and you'll go on another trip and you'll buy another toy, but you will never find what you're looking for. He is the only one who can fill this. So when God created creation and when God made the angels, none of them could fulfill God's longing of his heart. I think when Lucifer finally figured that out, he got unraveled. He could not handle the fact that he was not created for the affection of his heavenly father. You are. Wow. You are. And so if Jesus isn't the greatest longing of your heart, you'll fill it with something else someone else. And so we try that. And so we try to fill it with a marriage, a first marriage, a second marriage, a third marriage, a child, having kids. Maybe, maybe it's a, a best friend. I, I was in Memphis, young pastor. This is probably now 30 years ago. And a guy comes into my office and he said, Pastor, I need to talk to you about my wife and I. And I said, great. And he said, um, my wife's fulfillment is having more kids. And I'm thinking, well, what's wrong with that? And I said, well, how many do you have? He said, six. I said, wow. He said, no, you don't understand. He said, that's not enough. And I said, well, how many do you want? And he said, well, pastor. He said, I was done at three. And I'm thinking, well, you do know how this works, right? I mean, you know how this... And, and his whole point was, he finally realized that the deepest longing of her heart was to have more children but she could never have enough children to fulfill the deepest longing of her heart. Now, there's nothing wrong with having more children. There's nothing wrong with building a business. There's nothing wrong with making more money. There's nothing wrong with great investments. There's nothing wrong with, those are all good, but they're not very good. Wow. And so on the, on the six days of creation, the first five days, everything was good. But when God created you, he said, this is very, very good. And so if, you, if, if Jesus isn't the greatest longing of your heart, so you say, well, I don't know if he is or not. Great, you're being honest. It's good. That's why we wrote this album. The whole purpose of this album is for you to sing these songs in private, in worship, so that your longing of your heart gets directed properly and the longing of your heart is set where it needs to be. Yes. You see, your longings are gonna grow. Whatever you think about grows. Whatever you're dreaming about is going to grow. Whatever you're spending time and energy on, energy inside of you is going to be created. Mm. And so this song says, Jesus, I give it all away. Jesus, I lean in all the way. Jesus, I am desperate. Lower, lower, yield. It, it's an incredible song. And, 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 and so Ethan, um, she was right. It was a really good song about Jesus, by the way. <laughs> And, and, and it, it's so cool. All right, now, I want to go one more place with this, and I want to talk about David, because David was not born in this culture. We've got to go back about a 1,000 years before this, and I want you to hear, though, David's heart of worship, because had David been born, you know, when Jesus was alive, he'd have been, we, we, we would not have needed the Apostle Paul. It would have been David. David would have planted all those churches, but, but here's a guy that doesn't have the Holy Spirit in him. He has the Holy Spirit that visits him, and yet I want you to hear the passion of his heart. David understood, in other words, the only, there was no replacement. God, God was it. So um, Hans and Lisette, read for us a little bit out of First Chronicles. We read the Psalms and we hear David's heart, but I think I picked two passages that I want you guys to read that I don't think we ever read, and yet listen to the heart of David for God. Go ahead. Yes, I'll read uh, uh, First Chronicles 16, 17, I mean 7 through 11. Yep. 
Uh, it says, that day David first appointed Asaph as his associate to give praise to the Lord in this manner. Give praise to the Lord, proclaim his name, make known among the nations what he has done. Sing to him, sing praise to him, tell all of his wonderful acts. Glorify in his holy name, let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Look to the Lord and his strength, seek his face always. Go ahead, Lisette. I'll continue. Ascribe to the Lord, all you families of nations. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come before him. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. The world is firmly established. It cannot be moved. Let the heavens rejoice. Let the earth be glad. Let them say among the nations, the Lord reigns. Let the sea resound in all that is in it. Let the fields be jubilant in everything in them. Let the trees of the forest sing. Let them sing for joy before the Lord, for he comes to judge the earth. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, and his love endures forever. Cry out, save us, God, our Savior. Gather us and deliver us from the nations, that we may give thanks to your holy name and glory in your praise. Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Then all the people said, Amen, and praise the Lord. You hear his heart? There's no question. I mean, there's, a, there's like a good basket, and then there's like the best basket. David was a musician. David was a warrior. But David was a worshiper. Did you catch that? David was a worshiper. I want you to get this this morning. I don't think you've doubted at all what your heart's affections are. I think you've already figured that out. But I want you to be really clear. God is crazy about you. Amen. God loves you. God likes you. God wants to be with you. His, his heart is for your heart to be in his heart. That's his, that's his ultimate goal. And so there's nothing wrong with the good basket. I mean, I, I love... NFL football. I love it. I bought the NFL ticket. We watch eight football games at once. And the, the women are amazed that Ethan and I got the remote and we're watching eight different games. It, I got the ticket. I love the, I love NFL. In fact, don't bother me on Sunday afternoons when it's football season. Okay. I hope you don't have a problem because I'm on the TV watching my football games, the Colts, the Bucks, the Steelers. I'm watching all these different teams. I love it but it's not the affection of my heart, okay? I've already got fishing trips lined up for this year. I've already scheduled fishing trips. I can't wait. A good friend of mine from uh, Zionsville, Indiana, he and I are gonna go to Canada for a week. I've never fished a week in Canada. I, I'm giddy. I've lost sleep, not just to be honest with you, thinking about that <laughs> fishing trip. I have. I'm up in the middle of the night thinking of the lures and, you know, anyway, I, I, I should be praying, but I'm thinking about fishing lures. I, I can't wait to go fishing with my good friend. Can't wait. But, but it's in the good basket. It's not in the very good basket. Are you, with, are you tracking with me on this? So there's nothing. I love my family. I love my family. All three of my children are in this room right now. My two sons-in-laws and my daughter-in-law are in this room right now. My two grandchildren were back there in this room and we've got one coming and the one coming and still inside mama. But, and Danita, my whole family's, my, my family's in this room right now. I can't tell you how much I love my family. But even my family is in the very, it's, it's in the good basket. Because my, my, my great basket is my worship. My great basket is my, my affection for my heavenly father because my affection for my heavenly father then spills out into this basket. Okay. So I, I, I want to share something with you that I've never shared with you before. Pub, uh, private. Uh, I've done this privately, but not publicly. And I'm trying to help us with an illustration right now on your heart and how you feel. And, and so I... I I think there's nothing wrong with the good basket. The good basket is we get to live wherever you are. We get to live here and wherever you are online. If you're a golfer, you get to play golf here year round. I mean, there's a lot of good things in this good basket. 
If you're a bicyclist, I mean, we can, we can cycle pretty much 12 months out of the year here, can't we? And, and so there's a lot of good, good things. So I want you to think about the greatest gift that someone's ever given to you. So if you would, right now in your mind, maybe it was a bicycle. I'm not talking about the, the monetary, but, but the greatest gift that was ever given to you, perhaps your parents went through a divorce, perhaps there was poverty, and somebody bought you a bicycle. And really, that probably that bicycle means more to you than maybe any other gift. Or maybe somebody gave you a job, and, and, and you needed a job really badly. And someone gave you a chance, gave you an opportunity, and you really weren't quite qualified for the job yet, but they thought, and, and, and you're, so, you're overwhelmed. Maybe somebody gave you a house. Okay, let's go big. Somebody just, just blessed you with a house, and, and, and you're so grateful. I want you to think about the biggest gift. Maybe it was a diamond ring. Maybe it was a car. Maybe it was a... So it was right at 11 years ago, um, I'm taking Danita and Emily to the airport. And it's 5.30 in the morning, and Danita is going to go lead a women's conference, speaking parts, and Emily was going with her to basically be her assistant and to help with the children at this, in another country. It's 5.30 in the morning, and Danita screams. Now, that's not a good sign at 5.30 in the morning, Right? She opens the, the front door and she screams. And I come running. And in the front yard, our front yard, someone gave me a center console, beautiful fishing boat. And to this day, we have no idea who did that. There's duct tape on the front door for Pastor Kurt. There's $2,700 cash to pay the taxes. There's two unsigned titles, one to the boat, one to the trailer. They type the letter. It's anonymous. They're harbor siders. Could be one of you here, one of you there. Completely anonymous. And for 11 years, I have and we have no idea who dropped off gorgeous boat in my front yard. And if I were to see them, or if they were to say something to me, hey, we did it, I, I would thank them. I would, I would thank them. I would, I would hug their neck, okay? I, I, would, I would just I'd be so, what, what they don't know is, is we use this boat all the time. We've like worn out one motor. We're on the second motor. And when this one gets a couple thousand hours, I'll get another motor. So they have no idea what, what this did for us. So when, if, or, if I ever saw them, I, I would thank them. But I wouldn't fall on my knees. I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't stay down for an hour and not be able to get up. I would be grateful. It's a boat. <laughs> this is a savior. Yes. This is someone that has forgiven me of all my sins, of all eternity, of all my life. <laughs> I'm so grateful for the boat. You have no idea how much fish I've caught in that boat and how much fun I've had. But if I and when I, I'm going to bow. I'm going to, I don't even know if I can look up. Because what Jesus has done for you and what Jesus has done for me is he saved me from all of my sins for all of eternity. All of eternity, I am free and forgiven and clean and righteous and holy because of what Christ's blood did for me on the cross. So how can he not be the greatest affection of my life? How can he not be the one my heart longs for? If I saw those, that family, those people, I'd thank them every time I saw them. I love your boat. Thank you for the boat. Thank you for the boat. But, but it's not the same. This is like very, very good. This is like over the top, incredible, unbelievable what Christ has done for you. And so Jesus goes to a cross 
and sheds his blood so that you and I can live forever. And it's not just the there and the then, it's the here and the now. It's like now. So why would I ever get out of bed without the Holy Spirit? Why would I ever go to work without the Holy Spirit? Why would I ever drive on US 19 without the Holy Spirit, okay? <laughs> why, why would I ever start researching a message? Why would I ever try to parent or grandparent? Why would I ever do anything without the power of Christ in me? I, I give it all the way. I lean in all the way. Jesus, you're the one my heart longs for. And so these songs that were written by this team, they're written to help your heart to get redirected on what's really important. A lot of good things, a lot of good things. There's only one very good thing, and that's your relationship with Jesus Christ. And so we, we have this album, we have these songs to help you have your heart to grow and to have the affection in the proper priority, in the proper space, and in the proper place. Okay? So I really want you to embrace these songs. I do. I want you to memorize these. I, I, we want you, we've given a tool to put into your hands that will help you, man, to focus on that which is far more important than anything else. And so if you're in this basket over here where you're still chasing something or somebody or adventure, money, success, business, that's good, that's good. But, but, but let, let's come over here. This is very good. And, th and this then will make you far more successful in every area of your life.